This is the news load. Hi, I'm Carrie Ann Stevenson. Welcome to News Load, and today we're interviewing Mike Bullard. Hi, Mike. I've never had anyone enunciate my name that well. Thank you, Carrie Ann. <laughs> well, I'm a fan, and uh, I watched your show, and uh, I just think you're absolutely terrific, and I really appreciate you taking the time. I really appreciate being asked. Thank you. So you got your new phone all, all organized? Yeah, it's a great story, you know. I worked for Bell for 21 years when customer service was number one. It's ridiculous now. Yeah, yeah. So when I got back from Ukraine, they told me I was eligible for an upgrade, so I went and got a phone. So I was in Niagara Falls, Niagara on the Lake, doing, uh, hosting the last night of the Niagara Music Festival. And it was a fundraiser for Ukraine. So there was mist from the Niagara River and my phone conked out. So I go to the uh, Bell phone store in Sherway on uh, Thursday night. And the guy goes, uh, oh, yeah, you have to take it to Samsung. It's under warranty. I go, what are you talking about? I bought it here. He goes, no, you got to go to Samsung. So I go to Samsung. They tell me there's no technicians. Come back in the morning. So I come back yesterday morning. It's under warranty. They said, where were you when it happened? I said, Niagara. They said, yeah, you can't use it outside Niagara. It's not waterproof. Uh, we see by the monitor here that water got inside the phone, so your warranty is void. So I had to pay 378 bucks for a new phone just so you could interview me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. Uh, so you only pay 378 bucks. Anyway, I phoned Bell back, and because I know what to do, I launched an executive complaint, and they gave me a $378 rebate on my bill. So there you go. There you go. There you go. And if you're nice to me, I'll tell you how to do it. <laughs> I love that you use a Zippo. That's awesome. I got that in Ukraine. Wow. So tell me about Ukraine. You like, What's it like over there? Is it horrific? Yeah, it's World War II. It's World War, I wouldn't call it World War Three, but it is World War Two, And uh, the only reason I was prepared for it is because uh, I had uncles and uh, relatives who were heroes during World War Two, and I grew up with their stories, which kids don't grow up with today. And it's the only thing that prepared me for what I was going to see over there. And uh, two things I, I really don't want to talk about. One is because I'm not allowed to. One thing I did. But I'm proud I did it. And the first thing is, uh, I, I was in Dnipro with uh, a guy who, uh, an American, uh, Ben, who is a lawyer and does work in Ukraine. Now he's uh, raising money in Kentucky like I was doing. And we went to Dnipro to help after that apartment building got bombed. And uh, I went across the road to help him clear some rubble and uh, five and six year old were pulled out of the hole and I'll never forget that as long as I live. I had to see somebody when I got home once I'm okay now, but, uh, made me realize how precious life is. That's for sure. But I was never filled with such raw white hatred in my life. I can't believe what this guy's doing. And then yesterday I saw they put a bomb inside or a grenade inside a toy for a kid to pick up. You know, this guy's a monster. The only good thing he did was kill a Nazi last week, but, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure they're going to take him out because of it. You know, I'm pretty sure Putin hasn't got long left. And the oligarchs are pissed because, uh, you know, they're losing enough fortune. So I think when it comes down to that, somebody's going to take him out. I'm pretty sure Ukraine's going to win. Is there anything that we can do to help? I think, you know what, I think they're getting enough money. And there's a ton of corruption. I raised a lot of money when I was there, but it went through me because I couldn't afford to have it go through anybody else. The only organization there that I found that's completely honest is Paul Hughes Hugs Canada. So if you go to the Hugs Canada website, you can give money there. And believe me, Paul doesn't take any of it for himself. He's been there since day one. You know, I think the reason he's staying is because he's got a girlfriend now and he couldn't get one here. But <laughs> It's always about the ladies, isn't it? Uh, it is during a war. You know, I almost didn't come back because cigarettes were two bucks a pack. <laughs> Even though there were bombs going off around me 
I told a funny story about that in Niagara the other night because uh, they're lucky strikes, which I haven't seen since an episode of Mad Men. And my uncles all smoked them when I was a kid. So they're two bucks a pack, which I couldn't believe because they're 18 here. And you can't even get lucky strikes, which, by the way, are toasted. Like the old commercial, they're toasted. I never tasted a, a cigarette that good in my life. I hope there's no kids watching. No. Anyway, uh, I got back and I and I uh, bought uh, 10 cartons, 80 packs. So I put them in my bag. And I thought, yeah, I'll get through. But in the meantime, Ben and I had done a ton of video on Facebook and Twitter, which everybody followed back here. So I kept talking about the cigarettes and how cheap they were and how I might not come home. Anyway, I'm in the lineup of customs and a guy, a guy from customs walks over to me. I'm at the end of the line. He goes, Oh Mike, can you step out of the line? So I stepped out of the line. I go, yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, Oh no, man, they found my cigarettes. And, uh, I've never done drugs or drank, but I'm sitting there like, uh, it was right at a midnight express. I'm thinking I'm going to wind up in a Turkish prison somewhere because I got 80 packs of cigarettes even though it's Canadian customs. Now, you're probably too young to remember that movie. If you watch Midnight Express, you'll never smuggle drugs. Let's put it that way. Okay. So he goes, uh, oh, come to the front of the line. We all followed you uh, through Ukraine. So he takes me to the front of the line, and the uh, customs officer was a female, and she was Ukrainian-Canadian. And she says to me, uh, hi, Mike, how are you? I go, pretty good. She goes, so how many packs of Lucky Strikes do you have? <laughs> I first started laughing. I said, I don't know, five, baby. <laughs> she goes, uh, yeah, it sounds like 80 to me, but I'm Ukrainian-Canadian, so we're going to let you go. Aww. You can keep them. And she said, and we all put in, here's a $40 Tim Hortons gift card. And they handed me a gift card. It was the best experience I ever had at Customs. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, my only regret was I didn't bring back heroin. Yeah. <laughs> We we're gonna let me go. That would have been great, but it didn't happen. So, <laughs> and all my relatives found out. So the eighty packs lasted me about a week. Just, just gone already. Just flying. Yeah, they're going fast. Yeah. So, are you still married? No. No. Okay. Uh, kids? No. No, no. So just a, 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 a charming just bachelor. Me. Just me, yep. Good. Yep. That's, that's probably the... Well, the I, can that I can show you receipts from uh, Arby's and Harvey's and uh, Mr. Sub seven nights a week. Yep, yep. I'm a big fan of uh, Burger King and um, A&W and Chinese Takeout. That's that's the wonderful. Uh, Actually, A and W A and W's got the best breakfast. Although the deep fried French toast at Wendy's is fantastic. I'm a sucker for the Starbucks everything croissant with uh, egg and ham. So good. Well, I'm the my body is the temple that fried food built. So when I found out they were deep frying the French toast, I was the first person in line two months ago when they came out with it. <laughs> I was there at six o'clock in the morning. I couldn't wait. And I have it every uh, Sunday morning. It's a good treat. A deep fried everything is phenomenal. Are you are you yeah, into are you into carnival food like deep fried Twinkies and? No, I hate that stuff. Oh, I used to have a girlfriend who was a health fanatic. We used to go to the X once a year because she wanted a deep fried Twix bar. It was the only time I ever saw her put anything with sugar in her mouth. And every year we went to the X, and we went to the food building, and she had a deep fried Twix bar. And just looking at the thing made me sick. Aww. I wouldn't mind feeling like young Elvis, but you don't want to feel like fat Elvis. You know what I mean? I can't believe All that, that I've outlived. Me of fat Elvis. <laughs> I can't believe that I've outlived Elvis. I'm I'm shocked. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know he died um, so young. He was only 42. I had no idea. I still remember to this day the day he died. I know exactly where I was. I was in the Yukon earning money for school, working in a mine. And uh, we came up for uh, dinner. Uh, we were 300 feet down. We came up, and two guys came running in saying, Elvis just died. 
I'll never forget it. I couldn't believe it. I was in shock. It was kind of like a Kennedy moment for our generation, right, when he passed away. You know? But I like to remember him from the 68 comeback special, which my mother let us stay up and watch. Because he looked incredible. Did you see the movie? Yes. With Austin Butler? Yes. Beautiful. He was incredible. He was. Yeah, I I thought he should have won the Academy Award. You know? And by the way, uh, Killian Murphy's going to win it this year. I'll bet anybody 500 bucks is watching this for Oppenheimer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oppenheimer was wonderful. Best movie I ever saw in my life, ever, including The Godfather. I'm so and glad it, I saw it in theater because being able to have the explosion and the experience. And it was really lovely to see all the random uh yeah. You know, like B and 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 D listed actors in there as well. It's funny how you don't recognize Robert Downey Jr. till ten minutes in, huh? I know, and was, Robert. The I, was incredible. I really, He's going to win Best Supporting Actor. Yeah, I really appreciated that he was comfortable with taking on a villainous role, which was quite wonderful. Yeah, yeah. you know what? He should have done that a long time ago because he's always struck me that way, always. He's always struck me as a guy who could have done that, and I can't believe he didn't. I don't have a lot of faith in the Academy Awards. Tom Hardy didn't even get nominated for Legend, where he played both Cray brothers. I know. And that, that pissed me off so much. I've been angry at the Academy ever since. But uh, if it wasn't for Oppenheimer, my vote would go to Ryan Gosling for Barbie. Really? Oh, my God, is Kenny's hilarious. He steals the entire movie. You know, it's amazing. And people are really pissed about it, calling it woke and all that jazz. But in reality, it makes fun of woke. It's a very, very funny movie, but it's not for kids. Just be apprised of the fact that if you go, there's going to be 500 women there in their 40s and 50s in Barbie outfits. <laughs> yeah, that Halloween's really... going to be really fun this year with uh, with all the Barbies. Oh, yeah. And two girls made a fortune this summer at the, uh, which theater was it? Mississauga Cineplex. They made up a bunch of Barbie hats and T-shirts and waited outside every night. And I read in the paper they made 50000 bucks. two university students. Really? You know? Yeah. I didn't go for the Barbenheimer thing where you go see Barbie and Oppenheimer the same day. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. That's a long yeah, day. It's the most ridiculous thing in the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I yeah. have to admit, two and a half hours in, I was like, you know, okay, now we have to, you know, like go with his right. downfall and everything. And I get it, but it it just gets it it gets long. I, I'm glad I didn't see the um the Avatar in in theater because uh, just so long. I hated that movie. <laughs> hated it. Hated the Hunger Games. I think this new one coming out is going to bomb because it's the same chick who plays Snow White. Yeah. And she's really done herself in with these interviews about Snow White, the live action movie. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the seven drawers are seven regular sized guys now. That's how uh, that's how upset people get about things. It's just unbelievable. What are you thinking about all this cancel culture? With CGI, you could have, with CGI, you could have Peter Dinklage play all seven of the dwarves. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Hugh Grant uh, playing uh, an Oompa Loompa in the new Willy Wonka looks pretty good with the CGI and everything. Yeah, I think that'll do well. Okay. The thing I love about uh, Christopher Nolan, though, the director of Oppenheimer, is he doesn't use CGI. He used real explosives and real stunt people. And when you watched it on IMAX, you couldn't believe it. You could not believe what you were watching. You felt like you were uh, watching the atomic bomb go off. It was incredible. Yeah. And I really enjoyed uh, in the IMAX the the sound rumbling and your seat oh, yeah. and, and yeah. the whole experience. It was really, really wonderful. I remember going with two of my uncles to see uh, Saving Private Ryan. It was around the time THX sound came out. And when they landed on uh, Normandy, my uncles had to leave the theater. They told me it was so real, it was disturbing. It gave them PTSD. Yeah. yeah. Like Spielberg did such a great job of that, you know? Yeah, that opening scene was was extreme. Yeah, it was. It was disturbing for people who weren't even alive at that time. Uh, but I realized where my uncles were concerned, how, how disturbing it was to them. Yeah, for you sure. Know? For sure. Yeah. So more about you. Um, have you been starstruck by any celebrities that you've interviewed or met? 
thrilled. Uh, when you were doing the show, you couldn't afford to be starstruck or it would have made for a bad interview. But uh, I used to try and hide that, but I never hid the fact that I was thrilled when somebody came out. Somebody wrote about that once, which I was really happy to see. Um, biggest thrill in my life was Burt Reynolds. You know, and it's a funny story how he came on. Boogie Nights came out the week before. So he was back on top. And he was in Toronto doing Driven with Sylvester Stallone. So I was out shooting something, and one of the girls from the office called me and said, Burt Reynolds is on the phone. He wants to talk to you. I said, you know what, Jenny? There's no way Burt Reynolds is on the phone. I said, Norm MacDonald does a great Burt Reynolds. It's probably him. I said, lots of people can do an impression of Burt Reynolds. He goes, well, he says he wants to talk to you, and uh, I believe it's him. I said, yeah, you're 26 years old. You don't even know who he is. I said, uh, okay, put him on the phone. So he goes, hi, Mike Burr Reynolds. I go, uh, yeah, right. He goes, what? I go, yeah, sure you are. He goes, uh, look, it's Burr Reynolds. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, man, but, you know, people do this stuff all the time. We don't get people like Burr Reynolds on the show. You know, I had a guy on last week, an actor from a CBC show, and when I threw to an Advil commercial, he was in it. So that's the caliber of star I get on the show. There's no way you're Burt Reynolds. He goes, test me. I go, who is your first wife? Who is your wife? First wife. He goes, uh, Judy Karn from Laughing, and she was batshit crazy. And I go, holy shit, it's Burt Reynolds. <laughs> I go, who was your co-star on your first uh, TV series? He goes, it was Riverboat. It was Darren McGavin. And if he doesn't rise the first Easter after his death, he'll be surprised. I go, holy shit, it is. <laughs> so I go, uh, wow, Bert, I'm really uh, sorry. I, uh, I didn't know it was you. Uh, why would you be calling me? He goes, because I want to come on your show tonight. He goes, I've been in a hotel for a week and a half. I've been watching it every night, and I like you. I want to come on. Oh, that's amazing. I go, really? He goes, yeah. I go, okay. Uh, what hotel are you in? So he tells me the hotel. I go, we'll send a car for you. He goes, no, nah, it's okay. It's only a block away. I'll walk. And by the way, after dealing with some high-maintenance nobodies for a long time, hearing a guy like that say that blew my mind. He said, no, nah, it's okay. I'll walk. So uh, I phone the office. I go, cancel everybody. We're going to devote the whole hour to Burt Reynolds. The only other time I did that was with Burt and Cummings. Another thrill and a half. So he shows up. The show tapes at, uh, was taping at 6.30 then. He shows up at 4.30. Introduces himself to every single person on staff and remembers all their names. Every single person. He orders pizza for everybody. You know, I mean, this is a Canadian show. Believe me, for pizza to come, it might as well have been caviar. Yeah, for sure. So, so he goes, uh, he orders pizza for everybody. And then uh, I do the monologue. I intro him. He comes out. He sits down. I go, uh, listen, I got to tell you, uh, Longest Yard was the uh, best football movie ever set in a prison. So he looks at me and he goes, it's the only football movie ever set in a prison. I said, my point exactly. So he burst out laughing. The audience was laughing. And it just went up and up and up from there. I did three segments with him. We didn't even have a band on that night. I loved how he took risks. You know, he would be in movies like The New Dukes of Hazard with Johnny Knoxville. He was in Strip Tease. Oh. Well, he, was, he was having a bad time then. Lonnie Anderson took him for a fortune. And he was trying to hang on to his uh, ranch in Florida and his dinner theater. He made a really bad business investment with a chain of restaurants. So some of those films he was doing for the money. And it kind of made me sad. The thing that made me saddest was when he died, they had just signed him to be once upon a time in Hollywood. Bruce Dern took his place. You know, but when, when he came on that night, afterwards he said, guess what? You're coming back to the hotel. We're going for dinner. So I go to dinner with him, and the stories he told me were just unbelievable. I mean, this guy told me the deliverance story, which was amazing. He said Dan August, which was a TV series he had for one season, got canceled. He played a cop. 
And during the hiatus, he uh, filmed Deliverance. And he thought it was going to go nowhere. He thought the movie was going to go nowhere. He said, it opened on Friday. And by Sunday, I was a movie star. He said, on Monday morning, Johnny Carson's people called me and put me on The Tonight Show. He said, I'm telling you, a week earlier, I couldn't have got arrested. Told me the story about him and Clint Eastwood when they had Universal TV contracts. He said, uh, I hadn't met Clint. He goes, we both got called into Universal's head office, the casting office. So we're sitting in the waiting room. We introduce ourselves to each other. He had finished Rawhide. And I had just finished uh, playing the blacksmith on Gunsmoke. And we had contracts with Universal for TV. He said they paid uh, they paid us uh, two hundred and seventy dollars a week, which in like nineteen sixty three he said was big money. Like you could live on that in California. Okay. So he said uh, they called both of us in the office. We figure they're going to give us a bigger contract. They're going to extend us, and they go, "You're both fired." And he goes, "The casting guy uh, looks at Clint and goes." You can act, but your Adam's apple's too big. And he looks at Bert and he goes, you're good looking, but you can't act. So you're both fired. So he said, we walk out, we're walking to our cars. And Clint goes, geez, I'm married. My wife's pregnant. What am I going to do now? And Bert goes, well, I don't know what you're going to do about your Adam's apple, but I can learn to act. And then they both laughed and they didn't see each other again for years when they did a movie together. You know, stories like that were incredible to me. I'm sure. I'm sure they're they're incredible stories. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, Mike, I could sit and talk with you all day, but we're running out of time. Uh, but yeah, you're blowing me off. How long is this show? Only 20 minutes. How long did I do? About 20 minutes. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. I bet you blew me off at 18. <laughs> Well, well I think you're absolutely incredible. Uh, if you are rolling through London, Ontario, uh, please uh, let me know. We can we can try and book you for spots and such. You're, you're... Yeah, they, uh, they're going to open a new Yuck Yucks there. They want me to open it the weekend it opens, so I'll probably be there then. I'll, I'll send you an email. That'd be amazing. Uh, I, I'm, in, I... I'm in Lakefield tomorrow at the Burroughs Falls Inn, which is a five-star resort up in Lakefield. So that's where I am tomorrow at 8.30, so that's a plug for them. Cool, wonderful. And uh, how do we keep track of you? Just your your website? Uh, Twitter and Facebook. I got a guy working on a new website, but Twitter and Facebook. Okay. That's the best way. If I ever get my Facebook back or my new phone carrying in, trying to figure this stuff out is driving me insane. Oh, I know. A new a new phone is like a whole new world. It's it's chaos. Unbelievable. All right, hun. Thanks a million. Thank you, and uh, if you can do one more thing for me, if you can say uh, loud and proud, I love news load. Even if LGBTQ wanted to do that, I would do it. <laughs> okay, you ready? Yeah. Loud and proud, I love news world. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, I love you. Okay, you too, bye-bye. Bye. This is the news load.